is it is it possible to have a situation for, where a pharmaceutical company says, you know what, we're going to run this study through the U of M as opposed to this other college because we have had more favorable results with the U of M. They're they're a little more friendly to us. That's we, we don't like working with this other school. They're a little rigid. They're a little strict. They tend to be a little too fair. Um, that's possible. And where that plays out is usually, uh, one, how fast you can recruit patients because that's the big bottleneck. Uh, if you can't get patients into your study, the study takes a lot more time, and the longer it takes, the more money you lose. Um, so patient recruitment is one, um, one big issue. The other is ethics approval because every study, before it's done, has to be approved by an ethics board, a so-called institutional review board. And if you have a very uh, slow, inefficient um, institutional review board or one that turns down a lot of studies, then you'll get a reputation as a place where, you know, uh, a drug company just doesn't want to do business with you. I, I, even though you may have legitimate ethical concerns and that's, that's why you're right. turning it down. But, you know, they can always go somewhere else. That's the problem with the system. You, you, know, you have ethical concerns sometimes with the, the zealousness w with which people are recruited for certain studies and the types of people who come in. Uh, for instance, professional test subjects, people who do this as a way of making a living. Well, yeah, these are the um, so-called uh, safety trials. So before you can start testing a drug for an illness – on people who are sick, you have to test the safety of the drug on healthy subjects, usually. Guinea pigs. Right. Um, Human guinea pigs. And, you know, it's, not, it's a fairly uh, <laughs> unpleasant kind of process to go through because usually for these safety trials, these phase one trials, you've got to check into uh, a research facility. Often you've got to stay there for several weeks. You've got to have your uh, blood tested, lots of blood draws, urine tests. You might have to have invasive procedures of different kinds, so endoscopies, bronchoscopies. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people just don't want to do that. A lot of people don't have the time to check into a, a uh, research facility for three weeks. And so what's happened is that it's basically people who have no better options who do this. So, you know, homeless people, uh, a lot of students, uh, unemployed people, contract workers, um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants who can't work legally, uh, people just out of jail, um, basically people who, who can't uh, or don't want to have regular work. Now, um, the... The community that I got interested in and wrote about for the book are um, basically uh, people who volunteer for trials for a living. You know, some of them travel around the country volunteering for one trial after the other. And the privatization of the trials has made it the case that it's actually possible to make enough money. You know, sometimes for a three week trial, you can make five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Um, you know, you can make enough money doing these trials to, um, to support yourself. And I got interested in this group, particularly living in West Philadelphia, a lot of uh, sort of activist anarchist types who, um, who volunteer for drug studies for a living just because they want to live off the grid. Mm -hmm. Now, you, I mean, you might say... Uh, well, what's wrong with paying, uh, you know, with paying people to enroll in drug studies? And I think the problem is that you shift. I mean, th these are um, potentially risky, often extremely uncomfortable um, studies to enroll in. And we are shifting the burden of testing the drugs onto people who have no better options, basically the poor. Mm -hmm. So often who won't have access to those drugs once they're, once they're approved because they're, they'll never be in the economic <laughs> class to have health insurance. Mm -hmm. So 
you, you basically have a situ situation where you test drugs on the poor for the benefit of the wealthy. Right, right. And in the case of studies, the one you bring up in the Mother Jones article, where the drugs are for mental illness, it must get really dicey who you're getting for subjects. Well, I mean, if you look at that particular trial that I wrote about, um, you know, they were, you know, giving advice. Uh, you know, the contract research organization was giving advice where to recruit these uh, patients, homeless shelters, uh, patient support groups, basically where you would find people who have severe mental illnesses. And you have to, somebody has to decide that these people are, are of sound mind to be throwing themselves into these studies despite the fact that they have oh, an illness that might have uh, schizophrenia associated with it or they might be psychotic and yet they're able to sign a piece of paper saying I'll participate in this. Now in one particular case uh, the man was a 26 year old. He was certainly old enough to decide for himself whether or not uh, he should have been participating in the, in the study. Certainly his mother did not think he should. Uh, during a study conducted at the University of Minnesota, he committed suicide. You write about this in the Mother Jones piece. You also write about it in, in White Coat, Black Hat. Um, the mother adamantly uh, believed it was dangerous for him to be participating in the study. He was going downhill during the study, that the uh, researchers at the U were not taking into consideration his dicey mental state, and the suicide was not a surprise to her. It was a tragic end that she saw coming. No one listened to her. Uh, there was money to be, uh, there was money given to the university. What was it, $15,000 per subject? Roughly, yes. Roughly. So there was an incentive to get people, uh, to get them relatively quickly, to to not be too discerning again it just seems like as soon as the money is involved no matter what intentions there are what good intentions there are it gets dangerous and mistakes like this and as you say even though it can't be directly connected the suicide to the drug he was on during the test one thing we do know is that the mother's concerns were ignored and we do know that he did not have the kind of care during this study that, that he should have. Their interest in him was more as a subject. Her interest in him was as a son. And w when it was money and when it was a subject, that interest was not enough to save his life and is rarely going to be. Uh, I just, if, if it's other areas of life, if it's government, we all get it that this money getting involved screws things up. We all understand it. All the people working at the U in the medical school would understand the conflicts of interest if it were government and money. If it's medical school and money, they seem to uh, miss the connection, the idea that this is something worrisome. That's, I think you're exactly right. I mean, um, part of the Part of my concern about that particular study and the reaction or lack of reaction of the university is that, you know, it's the worst of a, a series of alarming uh, scandals at the university, many of them involving conflicts of interest and large um, payments from the pharmaceutical industry, in response to which the university has been developing or claims to have been developing a new conflict of interest policy. And um, as far as I can tell, there's nothing about the new conflict of interest policy that will prevent this from happening again. I mean, there's, there's nothing there to prevent the kinds of large payments from the pharmaceutical industry that the investigators in the trial were getting there was nothing, there's nothing in there to control the kind of financial incentives they had to recruit a subject like that into a trial and to keep him from dropping out of a trial. Um, there's, n there's no effort to cap or limit payments from the pharmaceutical industry. There's no effort um, to control 
the influence of pharmaceutical money into continuing medical education. And, um, you know, my concern is that unless some kind of serious action is taken, it's just going to happen again. The book is White Coat, Black Hat, Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine by Carl Elliott. Uh, He's a professor at the Center for Bioethics at the U of M, and he has uh, several other books. He's also the author of uh, Better Than Well, uh, Prozac as a Way of Life, The Last Physician, and A Philosophical Disease. He lives here in Minneapolis, uh, also writes for The Atlantic, uh, New Yorker, Slate.com. We'll be back to wrap up uh, with Carl after this. Stick around. This is News Radio 830 WCCO. News Radio 830 WCCO. This is the night show. This is from the jacket of white coat, black hat. If you think your doctors prescribe medications for you on the basis of their unbiased judgment and objective medical research, this book will disabuse you of that old-fashioned fantasy. (laughs) Carl Elliott's the author, White Coat, Black Hat, Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine. Uh, You write, there are still plenty of honest doctors out there, but honesty is getting harder to find all the time. Without actually intending it, We've constructed a medical system in which deception is often not just tolerated, but in fact rewarded. A series of social and legislative changes have transformed medicine into a business. Yet because of medicine's history as a self-regulating profession, no one is really policing it. On the surface, our medical system looks very similar to the way it looked 25 years ago. Dig deeper, though, and you can see the same patterns of misconduct emerging again and again. Um, and as you write, it, while it's tempting to blame these problems on, on the pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, it takes two to tango. And uh, that's, the, that's the most troubling part of this. We expect the pharmaceutical companies to be filled with, with greedy people in a hurry to make a lot of money and maybe not dot in the I's and crossing the T's in all cases and maybe fudging results here or hiding some s- data there. That's unfortunately human nature when we're in this ungodly world of gigantic profits. Uh, but we still, to some degree, in this country, put doctors on a pe- pedestal and uh, med schools and believe they wouldn't be cooperating in this nonsense. And what this book does is show that uh, wrong. There's, there's, the money is flowing in so many different directions, everyone's corrupted. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. But it's not just doctors. I mean, there's a whole range of uh, kind of niche industries and uh, private contractors involved that, um, you know, that are involved with it as well. You are a bioethics professor. You, you s- stand in front of students at the U of M and talk about this stuff, the very stuff we're talking about? Sure. Do you talk about it to students who then go on to become MDs? Sometimes, yeah. What do they say? What do they say about the world they're going into, the system they're going into? They're still uh, they're, they're still eager and naive. Uh, the medical students are, are actually probably, at this point, the strongest voice against pharmaceutical industry involvement. Um, The American Medical uh, Student Association is uh, very active uh, in, you know, working against excessive industry influence and pushing medical schools to develop conflict of interest policies and so on. Um, The problem is the older and more experienced they get, the more cynical they get and the more co-opted they get. Right, right. They're idealistic when they're young and part of the problem when they're old too often. Uh... Well, it, it, as I said, I read the book, and it just it just angered me. Uh, you'd love to believe that uh, this is going to change, and things are going to get better, and we're going to address these problems, and uh, it's going to be a safer world for everybody uh, who's ill and needing medicine. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't be sure of that, and that's, that's the troubling part. White Coat, Black Hat, Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine. Carl Elliott, thank you so much for your good work on this. I really enjoyed it. hope you have a lot of su- success with it. Thank you, and thanks for having me in. 
We will take our final break and wrap up the hour. News Radio 830 WCCO.